Uh, I'm delighted that uh, Madeleine Dumont is going to be our speaker tonight uh, in this inaugural event because it's a great program that we have in store for you. Molly uh, um, was working in the Obama administration. She was the director of policy for the Department of Defense, uh, her involvement as a citizen in that. Uh, she's currently the chief of staff to Dr. Leon Bonstein at Bard. I'm very happy to say she's also a member. Advisory board. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, Thank you, Jack. Peter and Jack, and thanks for putting this um, this series together. It's uh, it's terrific, and I'm really honored to be the the inaugural speaker. Um, I can't remember how we decided on this topic, but it's something I know a little bit about um, because, um, as Jack mentioned, I did work in the Pentagon for a long time. Um, I started my career as a China specialist. I studied Chinese as an undergrad, and um, my first job was uh, working in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. I worked in the defense attache office, and I just sort of fell in love with um, with these really interesting questions about um, grand strategy and U.S.-China relations and what the future of China was going to be. Now, that was back in the late 90s when there, there wasn't the China we see now, right? There was a lot of promise, but there were also um, a lot of difficulties. And so it's been fascinating to follow the rise of China, and that's a little bit of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I thought I would forget if I didn't bring this up first. So um, I will just mention two books. If, if you find the talk interesting, you wanna read more, um, Taylor Fravel is a fantastic um, writer about uh, China. His book, Active Defense, China's Military Strategy Since 1949, highly recommend it. Um, and then this is a new one, Susan Shirk. Um, she's a, a former American diplomat. She's now at UC San Diego. This book just came out. And in fact, there was an article, an excerpt or a summary of this. It, it was either yesterday or today in the Times. Um, it's called Overreach, How China Derailed Its Peaceful Rise. So these are two of the things that I looked at when I was preparing this talk tonight, and I just wanted to mention them in case, uh, in case you're interested in learning more. Um, just a little bit more about my background. As Jack mentioned, I worked in the Pentagon. I, I was focused on China stuff for a long time, and um, in fact, one of my former bosses is in the room tonight. Uh, <laughs> that was a nice surprise. Um, but then I moved into overall defense strategy. I wasn't just focused on China anymore. Um, but of course, as China continued to grow, um, even though I wasn't focused on China, it was a big part of my job as, as a defense strategist to think about how to counter China and what part it should take in our national defense. Um, speaking of which, the timing of this talk is really um, outstanding. I mean, when we first scheduled this for tonight, we didn't know that the Biden administration was gonna release its national security strategy, which just happened two days ago, I think. Um, and China is the first foreign nation that is mentioned. If you read through the executive summary, it, it talks about China as a major problem for the United States. Um, and then this Sunday, um, the biggest Chinese political event of this, this year, certainly, potentially the next year as well, is starting the 20th Party Congress. It's a, it's a major event um, at which the Chinese Communist Party will elect its leader for the next five years, who's also the president of China. Um, so this is taking place at a very auspicious moment. Um, my purpose tonight is not to try to turn anyone into an expert on the Chinese military, um, but to give you um, some phrases to become familiar with, some concepts that'll help you understand um, why China is doing what it's doing um, in the world today. So let me see if this works. Okay, excellent. Can you still see me okay, Bill? Is this working? Everyone can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. We're a small enough group. If you can't hear or see, just please interrupt. Uh, so these are some things that I want to talk about this evening. Um, some of the trends we see uh, in, in Chinese, um, Chinese actions. So historically, Chinese military and territorial ambitions, as I'll talk about in a moment, weren't, were pretty limited. Uh, and now, in the past couple of years, we've seen a much more aggressive China. So I want to get into a little bit why, why exactly is that the case? Um, what strategies are, are part of that? 
Um, and how does that fit with some of their long-term goals in, in the region um, and in the world? And I, I want to talk a little bit about being the challenges of a, the challenges of being a China watcher. So, um, and this is this is really important and one of the um, one of the topics that concerns me about U.S.-China relations right now is that it's so difficult to live in China at the moment because um, because of the pandemic and because of all the extra controls they've been they've put on um, how citizens can just live their lives. The the increasing censorship. Um, it's a lot of Americans who used to be based there um, have left. Um, I was recently in Singapore and I visited with a friend of mine who is head of a major think tank and he'd been based in Beijing for a really long time um, and he couldn't stay there anymore. And he was one of the, he's just, he's an example of the kind of person who is an American China expert living in China, trying to understand what's going on with the Chinese, explain America to China, explain China to Americans, and now he's not there anymore. Um, and he's not the only one I know who has left. Uh, so there are less sort of eyes on the Chinese. Um, there's less, um, ability to interact directly with between the US and Chinese um, on some of these sensitive issues. And I think that's that's really concerning to me. Um, and the other aspect I'll mention of the difficulty of being a China watcher is it's, it's increasingly politically sensitive in the United States as well. We've seen um, sort of ebb and flow of that um, throughout the past couple decades. So there have been times in my career when the FBI came and questioned me and thought I was somehow being unpatriotic or, or um, was uh, you know, engaging potentially in questionable activities because I was studying China so closely. And um, we have to have people who are studying China. It's, it's one of the most consequential nations in the world, but it's gonna, be, it's, this is gonna be more and more difficult. Just the environment, the atmosphere within which US-China relations are taking place is gonna be more and more difficult. So I'm not here to scare anyone, but, um, and I'm not a pessimist, but the, this is, um, I just apologize in advance, this is not an uplifting <laughs> presentation, uh, but I think it, it's important for us all to be aware of these things. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to share this information with you tonight. All right, this is not entirely accurate, and I'll say what's left off of it, but I figured this is, this is a good place to start. It's a very um, easy, readable graphic. Um, so Chinese territorial disputes, you, you might notice one of the main things missing from this is China's largest northern um, neighbor, Russia, um, which would fall under uh, the, the blue resolved disputes. But the, the, the main thing to take away from this is um, China has a lot of borders with a lot of different countries and it's had problems with almost every single one of those countries um, and a lot of them are still going on. I mean, the exceptions are this little 50 kilometers, that's Afghanistan. I mean, Afghanistan's not in the border dispute with China. They've got a lot of other things to worry about. Um, and, uh, and, and Laos. Uh, everywhere else, uh, China has had border disputes. Um, and so it's, and, and throughout their history of several thousand years, I mean, we all have heard about why the Great Wall of China was, uh, was built. It's because China has continually been invaded. Um, so that sort of sense of trying to develop a, a, a well set up border still exists. So um, not to oversimplify, but I, um, I broke down sort of historical eras um, in, in pretty big chunks. So the military and territorial ambitions of the PRC's first 50 years. The People's Republic of China um, was founded in 1949. Um, and as you know, that was right after World War II and China had, was coming out of um, a really horrible occupation by uh, Japanese military of, of much of it. They were completely destructive. They raped and pillaged their way across China. Um, this, is, this was not a strong country in 1949. It had a ragtag band of, of communist soldiers um, who um, you know, won the Civil War, but um, they, it was not, it was not <laughs> um, a superpower by, by any stretch of the imagination. And this ragtag band had the world's largest land border um, to try to secure. Um, so it's over 22,000 kilometers of aggregate land borders in China. Um, and 
and, and plus all the maritime. So trying to secure the borders of this country is, um, is an enormous task. And that's really what, um, in terms of military and territorial ambitions, it was an ambition for them to try to resolve all these border disputes. So this line here, since 1949, these are all the, that's a list of the border disputes that existed when the People's Republic of China um, was established in 1949. I put in green the ones that have been resolved since then. So you see this, this big list of ones in black, those still exist. Um, and then it hasn't been static. I mean, the other disputes have come into existence. So when the USSR fell apart, uh, suddenly China had border disputes with former Soviet republics. Um, now it has resolved those as well. Um, and then separately it had issues with Myanmar and Mongolia. So there, there was the, the amount of um, diplomacy and diplomatic effort that went into resolving these border disputes was really what, what took up a lot of their um, a lot of their, their time and they, there was no, um, they couldn't really have that many territorial ambitions. They just had to define their own territory to begin with. Uh, I put Taiwan in a separate category because um, it was, it's not a border dispute except between Taiwan and China itself. And the idea there is, is more about um, sovereignty um, rather than, uh, you know, borders. Um, Taiwan is, um, has been since the beginning the the biggest um, well territorial ambition of, of, of China is to, is to regain control over uh, over the territory of Taiwan. So, uh, as you probably know, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, China was not very strong economically either. So, um, they didn't really have the ability to create a very strong military. So they weren't trying to um, build something huge and and very capable. They were trying to, in support of securing these borders, um, create a military that could at, at least repel invasions. Or um, actually in 1956, the, the, uh, the first national military strategy they released, it wasn't even about repelling invasions, it was trying to defeat the enemy by bringing them in deep and then you, you would sort of overwhelm them once they were deep inside your, your territory. So they were very, they, they knew they had very few military capabilities um, and so their strategy uh, reflected that and they just, they didn't have the economic wherewithal to, to do much more than, um, than try to organize this, uh, the, these border disputes. Um, so uh, other reasons why they weren't able to focus on building a stronger military, um, you may have heard of things like the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. There were a lot of domestic issues that they were more focused on um, or that they were using their military for. Um, the, they, were, they were focused domestically and not so much, um, not quite as much uh, internationally. And they spent a lot of time studying more advanced militaries. I mean, one of the advantages of a communist system is that they're very focused on planning um, and they take their time. And, um, and so every conflict the United States has been in, um, in over the past 20 years, more than that, the, the Chinese have really carefully studied what we've done and they've tried to learn from that and apply it to their own system. So a lot of what they were doing during the first uh, couple years, a couple decades after the, um, the People's Republic of China was founded was trying to, trying to just consolidate what they had, um, study what others were doing and then figure out um, you know, how to get a little bit stronger. So at first it was lure the enemy in deep in 1956. So this, this isn't, uh, isn't very, um, doesn't instill a lot of confidence in their ability to have a really strong border. Uh, but then as, um, as the years go by and China gets stronger, um, 1980, they, uh, they released a strategic guidance called Active Defense, um, which as I mentioned that book before, it's, it's, still, it's still really important in Chinese military strategy, this concept of active defense, which is sort of, um, instead of trying to bring the enemy in and overwhelm them in, you know, in, in the hinterlands, you're trying to push out where the border actually is. So you're defending beyond the border to prevent them from actually invading. Um, so it's a more forward defensive posture and that still animates a lot of their thinking. Um, and then they started um, talking about more high-tech local wars, high-tech inform inf informatized wars. We'll see more of that on the next slide. Um, 
so basically you see this trend here is they're starting they're building more capabilities but they're, they're thinking as they feel more confident as their economy starts to grow um, they are able to focus um, a little bit more be beyond uh, beyond the border but it's still um, much of it is about avoiding direct confrontation um, in their military strategy oops yeah okay so um, so starting with 2001, uh, just continuing the trends. So these are the border disputes that um, still exist. Now these two, Bhutan and India, are um, land disputes. And some of that is because, I mean, Bhutan is, you probably know, incredibly mountainous. I mean, it's just technically difficult. Um, and uh, the Bhutanese are not a major competitor. So that's not really a strategic, um, a major strategic issue. India certainly is. I mean, there are certain, there are several areas along the Chinese Indian border where there have been disputes, um, increasing numbers of disputes um, over the past couple of years. But the rest of those, those are all uh, maritime, um, maritime disputes. Um, most of them in the South China Sea, but then Japan, the, the East China Sea. So these uh, border disputes, and, and then of course Taiwan, an island right off the Southeast coast of China. Um, so as, as the Chinese economy is really kicking into high gear here, and the Chinese are investing more in, um, in trying to resolve some of these border disputes and, and uh, making sure they have territorial integrity, there's a lot of focus on, on the Navy um, and, and building maritime uh, capabilities because a lot of these disputes are, are maritime disputes. Uh, during this time as well, um, there starts to be much more of a connection between how um, the Chinese leadership is thinking about strategy and, um, and how economic, military, and diplomacy are all working together to support the overall goals. They, they do a much better job of sort of integrating those things than our system does, um, again, because it's centrally planned. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an American patriot, but I see there are some uh, advantages of the way they, they plan in the military system in terms of organizing things and, and putting an entire humongous bureaucracy on a very clear path. Um, so it's uh, one of the things they do is, is bringing these three things um, together. And when I say expanding concepts of national security, um, as their economy grows and they have more, um, more trade contacts overseas, uh, um, a, a lot more, um, well, mainly trade uh, and, and, and overseas investment, the, there's, there, they start to think of the connections between e economics and military as, as uh, the military needs to support um, economic movements overseas. And so we'll see in, in, in a moment how those things work together. Um, but generally in Chinese strategic culture, everything is subordinated to the big national goal. And the national goal right now is, is expanding Chinese power and influence and everything else is subordinate to that. So these things are working together. Chinese military and territorial ambitions as the economy grows is supporting the growth of, of, of the economy in some ways. Um, so they continue to release strategic guidance and guidelines. Um, and some of that starts to include some large-scale um, organizational reform of the People's Liberation Army um, to make it more professionalized. I mean, it's still um, an enormous military force. It's actually a little bit smaller than it was um, because they wanted to make it more professionalized. So they, um, they focus more on training and less on just overall numbers. Um, a lot of investments in equipment and um, all different kinds of training, training of, of um, of non-commissioned officers to make sure that they know how to manage troops, training of different kinds of troops training together, combined arms training, uh, night training, uh, special oper operations training, just all different kinds of training to um, increase their capabilities, um, again, in support of, of their strategic goals of expanding um, their economic power and their, and their influence overseas. I've mentioned nuclear strategy here because I figure somebody might be wondering or thinking about it. China is a nuclear power. Um, their nuclear strategy is mainly about um, deterrence. It's not their, their, milit their nuclear forces. They don't um, integrate that uh, very strongly into the rest of how the military is, is training. Um, at least they haven't. Now that's one thing that might change. But um, and. Despite the growth in the military um, and, their, um, and China's 
influence during this time, there's still a lot of focus on China having a peaceful rise. I and mean, that's how they present themselves internationally. That's how they talk about their, um, their increasing actions overseas and, and activities. It's, this is the peaceful rise of China. Um, and they're really trying to, in a lot of ways, um, differentiate themselves from, um, from the United States. They often call the United States an aggressor in international conflicts. And, and uh, so this is how they like to think about themselves. So I want to just show you where a couple of them of the current um, territorial disputes are again, so you can have some familiarity with some of the phrases here. So nine dash line, um, so called because this is this is basically China's map of what they think they they own, and it's got nine red dashes on it. That's that's why it's called the nine dash line. Now that's China all the way up there. This is I forget it's like. 2,000 kilometers, um, I, I can't remember exactly. Um, and as you can see, it goes all the way down here. I mean, the entire South China Sea and, and these two island uh, groups of islands, the Paracels and the Spratlys, and then all these other nations you see here um, have you know dispute parts of this. So, and, uh, so for example, in, in this area, there's a lot of Philippine fishing boats. You may have heard about Chinese um, Coast Guard vessels um, harassing Philippine fishermen. That's, you know, that's happening around over here. Up in this area, um, you know, uh, China has been, um, I mean, that's where, the, you know, Vietnam has more of a claim. And underlying a lot of this area are um, oil and gas deposits. So there are a lot of Oh, and in addition to that, it's also one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. So I think over half of um, the energy, or the oil that's transported to, for example, Japan um, or you know East Asia comes comes right through the South China Sea. So it's a very strategically important area, and China basically claims all of it for themselves, um, and they have not agreed to any kind of UN dispute resolution. Um, they're their uh, strategy so far has been to uh, say this belongs to us, and we're going to we're going to make these these islands bigger and put um, put military uh, equipment on them to sort of solidify our claim. So there are a lot of places throughout the South China Sea where China has literally built islands, or on some little coral reef, they poured a bunch of concrete and turned it into an island. They you know they put a little hut on it, and um, and, and they claim that as as their territory. So, and there, it's so it's very it's very volatile here, and there are a lot of c different competing claims. Say again. Well, I said that's not the art of war. Yeah. So I think this may have lost battery, whatever. But I will just. Um, okay. Uh, so another current. Um, so what we just saw was all of this down here. This is the South China Sea. Um, another phrase to be familiar with if you're interested in um, Chinese military territorial ambitions is the first island chain. So they call the first island chain, it's sort of all this through here. Taiwan is obviously on the first island chain. And then um, right around here is an, the territorial dispute with Japan. In Japanese, it's called the Senkaku Islands, and Chinese, it's called the Diaoyi. And there's a big gas deposits under those islands. Um, so the, the idea is this first island chain is, um, we talked about the concept of sort of forward defense, active defense, that this first island chain um, can kind of be China's forward line of defense. And so they don't want, I mean, this is a very short distance here between Taiwan and the mainland. They, they, uh, they, they don't want you know, US military to <laughs> have a lot of influence over Taiwan. Well, it's too late now, but um, th that, uh, they don't want that to exist in perpetuity, obviously. They still view Taiwan as part of China. I'll start from the bottom here. Um, so this is from the new national security strategy that just came out two days ago. Um, so this is what President Biden is saying. The People's Republic of China harbors the intention and increasingly the capacity to reshape the international order in favor of one that tilts the global playing field to its benefit even as the United States remains committed to managing the competition between our countries responsibly. So this description is much different from you know, 1949 when the People's Republic of China was just barely trying to figure out how to resolve their, you know, their border disputes and keep their, their territory um, secure. Uh, so when, when you say reshape the international order, um, 
it's we're talking about global change. The international order is everything that governs um, how nations interact with each other. Uh, so um, trading regimes, um, uh, currency markets, I mean, it's, it's everything that, 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 that governs the interactions between countries. So this is, um, this is the current US assessment that, that China has, has this intent. Um, similarly, every year the Defense Department is required by law to um, release a report on the Chinese military. And, and these are unclassified, by the way, obviously, otherwise this wouldn't, <laughs> this wouldn't be here. You can find these, um, you can Google. Um, the annual report, and I think the, the next um, annual report from the Department of Defense is going to be released probably in the next month or so. Um, and so it's, it's like 200 pages of dense information about current state of the Chinese military. So this is what I was talking about just a moment ago about this nexus between diplomacy, military, and economics in China. The U.S. Department of Defense says China is the only competitor capable of combining those things to mount a sustained challenge to a stable and open international system, reshaping the international order, um, authoritarian interests. So uh, this is, again, a big change from uh, several decades ago. And that is, how do we know what the intent is? You look at... Um, you look at the capabilities and you look at um, how they demonstrate what they're going to do with them. So they have an increasingly capable and effective force that is um, increasingly professionalized. Now, the, there have been um, complaints for decades the Chinese military is not very transparent when it comes to sharing information about itself. Of course, there are classified things about any military, but um, in U.S.-China military to military relations, the, there's always been more openness on our side to them than there has been back to us. So um, it's, it's, uh, we, we, we know what we think we know, and uh, there, we know their defense budgets are much bigger than they report they are, for example. So but we don't know exactly how, how much they're spending on defense. So there's limited transparency, but we do see that they've put a lot of investment into their military and it's, um, it's, more, it's better resourced. Uh, and they're working a lot more effectively um, within their militaries with each other. They have better command and control um, and it's just organized. Um, They've, they've reorganized from um, into a more military campaign focused structure. And they've shown um, in the past couple of years a, a lot more willingness to, to use their military um, to support some of their goals in, in other areas. Uh, so we've seen a huge increase in the number of military exercises that they're holding, especially around disputed areas like Taiwan, um, or even, um, I think it was last year they did one not far from Hawaii, so sort of like trying to, you know, um, say the United States, okay, you're going to go through the Taiwan Straits, well, we're going to be more active around, you know, near your um, territories. Um, they're one of the um, biggest arms sales uh, in, in the world, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment about this controlling access to economically important infrastructure abroad. So. China now, because its, mil its e economy has grown so big uh, and it has increasingly global economic interests, they can influence a lot of places around the world without having a military presence there. So their military and territorial ambitions now, are, they're linked very much to economic interests um, and they need the military to support and help protect that, um, but the economics themselves give them access to a lot of places. Just earlier this summer, China um, signed a security pact with the Solomon Islands, which is this little corner of the Pacific, really close to Australia. Um, and you can see that's pretty far from the regions right around China. Um, so not directly involved in any of their current territorial disputes at all. So what, what would be the purpose of having a security pact with the Solomon Islands. Well, it must be related to the fact that it's right next to Australia and Australia is one of the main allies of the United States in helping um, support regional stability. I mean, there, there are a lot of questions. It was a big surprise um, that the security pact took place. Um, and 
uh, you could see, I mean, the Solomon Islands got less than a million people living there. There's really, there's nothing about the islands themselves other than their location <laughs> close to Australia that really make this um, uh, attractive um, to the Chinese. So this, this is another way that they're getting access to, um, to territory in other places. Th this is the first such pact that I'm aware of um, that they've signed. I don't know if they have any others they're planning, but um, again, you don't have to take over a place with your military to have access to it to uh, you know, use it for your strategic benefit. This is an example of how China is using economics to um, give it access to, uh, to different areas around the world. And, their, um, their military is involved in this to the extent that some of the ports on here, um, the Chinese Navy potentially is going to be visiting or using some of those places. So obviously this is China. Um, BRI is Belt and Road Initiative. You may have heard of that phrase. It's, it's a big Chinese infrastructure investment. I mean, billions and billions of dollars. And they're investing it around the world. Um, and you can see they have a lot of different kinds of things they're investing in. So the ports in, um, in Pakistan, um, they actually had their first China, overseas Chinese military base in, um, I think it was Djibouti. Uh, and, and these are to protect some of these, um, uh, some of these international trade routes. And you can see from the colors here that for a lot of these countries where the investments are taking place, China is one of their top trade partners. And so the fact they're creating um, ports where the Chinese Navy can be active um, is, is very much connected to supporting and protecting uh, some of their trade relationships. It's a, a similar, uh, similar view, except this is the, the other one I just showed you is more about um, the maritime, and then you can see a lot of the, uh, um, these are the territorial um, or the, yeah, the land-based um, connections that that they're creating through the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and so, for example, um, in, you see a lot of these routes through, uh, through Central Asia, um, railroads, oil pipelines, gas pipelines. Um, and it was, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was founded, but um, so China created a, a collective security organization called the, um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, I think it was about 20 years ago um, that China and a bunch of these countries in Central Asia belong to together. And a lot of it is about ensuring regional stability. And, and they have, uh, it's, it's not a very strong, it's not like a NATO-like organization. It's not that kind of, it's not that capable. But um, one could say that they probably wouldn't have created it if they didn't have economic interests in that, in that area. Um, so. It's, it, I mean, it's just stunning the amount of investment in all these, all these different places. And so you'll see an increased Chinese military um, activity in some of these places. Um, so just focusing on India for a moment, this is actually taken from an Indian newspaper. So um, the Indians looked at that Belt and Road Initiative and all the Chinese investment in ports and then the increased Chinese naval activity, and they saw oh, China's trying to surround us and contain us. Um, and uh, so, for example, China, this is so all these little red dots with the, with the stars on them. This, is, um, this is, denotes uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese bases of some sort. So China has a, a huge lease on a major uh, port in Sri Lanka, for example. India is, a, is, a, is an ally of the United States. Uh, and this whole area has... Um, this area, the Indian Ocean, has become more of a competitive area between China and India as more and more Chinese economic interests have, have gone through that area. Um, so there's a lot of concern, not just from the United States over things like Taiwan, but India really concerned about how they see or how they feel that China is trying to potentially contain them. I show this not because, you know, in, Increases in defense spending on their own don't really tell us a whole lot, um, but um, and and also because there's such a lack of transparency, we don't know for sure what the official Chinese defense budget is. This is estimates from Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. They're really one of the leading think tanks that looks at things like this. So. Um, 
the investments, though, are in the areas that I was talking about before. More, more equipment, more advanced um, uh, weapons, um, a lot more uh, Navy ships. I mean, they have aircraft carriers now. They didn't have those before. Um, so this defense budget um, does translate into a lot of uh, increased capabilities. This is, again, probably, I would say, um, in terms of Chinese national psychology and what the leadership talks the most about, Taiwan is probably the most important thing to them, um, regaining control over Taiwan. And these are some of the capabilities they have that can help them um, intimidate Taiwan. Um, there's, I think a lot of people have been wondering about what is China learning from Russia and the Ukraine? Are they going to, uh, do they feel more um, intrepid about just attacking Taiwan? And um, they don't really need to directly attack Taiwan because they can, they can threaten it and and uh, sort of almost blockade it or bully it. There's so many different ways they could influence what Taiwan does. They don't, they don't need to attack it directly. But if they wanted to, they could, and they have increasing, um, increasing military capabilities in the area. Um, and I think I have on the next slide, uh, I mean, one of the ways that, um, one of the reasons we th think China hasn't attacked Taiwan is, um, is that the, the military balance between the U.S. and China has been in the U.S.'s favor for a very long time. And so there's this deterrent effect of the knowledge that we have a lot of, you know, we have our own uh, Navy ships that are patrolling the Western Pacific. Um, we have submarines. We, we've, we've done a lot to help uh, the Taiwan uh, military uh, increase their training capabilities. And so all of that is to try to deter um, Chinese aggression towards Taiwan specifically and or um, increased Taiwanese capabilities enough so they could um, they could slow a Chinese invasion to the point that the Americans can come in and rescue them. Um, but with all the investment that China has been putting into its military, um, that military balance across the, the strait has been really changing and um, various assessments say that uh, China will sort of overcome or have a stronger um, military capability and presence in the area than, than the United States within the next five years. So, but why, why is this happening? Why is China being more aggressive around the world, having more military exercises? I mean, the, their economy is doing, has been growing pretty rapidly. Um, they don't need to bully and intimidate their neighbors in order to have a strong economy. Um, why, so why are they doing this? This phrase, great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, um, that's, that's something the President Xi Jinping has talked a lot about. It's encoded in Chinese strategy. And the idea is they would do that by 2049. Um, in a lot of communist systems, anniversaries are very important. So this would be the 100 year anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. And they wanna be able to say, our great Chinese nation has been rejuvenated and our, uh, we have a world-class military and there are specific metrics that they associate with all those things and they have five-year plans to meet all those metrics. And so it's very, very organized the way they approach these goals. Um, and at this point, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's coming about for a number of reasons and we can speculate to a certain extent on, on whether, you know, to what extent these are all true, but this is this is my own view of, of why China's uh, being more aggressive. Um, partly it's because they take a so-called great power um, view of international relations, which um, is uh, believes that there's sort of a zero-sum game. And so um, with the United States being, as they see it, increasingly vulnerable, um, they think that you know, we have we're, we have so many domestic problems, and um, our military is is uh, is less capable than it used to be. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about the U.S. Army's recruiting problems, and um, they so they see that their gain at our expense to a certain extent. They still have a lot of problems with their military. It's, it's not as, as modern as ours, but they have made in, incredible strides over the past couple of decades, so they have a lot of confidence in that, um, and that confidence drives them to use this wonderfully capable uh, military that they have. Uh, 
this one increasingly consolidated domestic leadership power. It's interesting. So I'm sure you've all heard of Xi Jinping. He's um, potentially going to be elected to a third five-year term as head of the Chinese Communist Party at this upcoming party congress I just mentioned. Um, and he is um, a true strong man in a lot of respects. Um, now, ironically, I mean, there, there's some speculation now, or there's been some reporting that um, that there's actually been some protests against him um, in China. So whether he's stronger, he like, I mean, he could consolidate his power and that could drive him to want to be more aggressive. Or if he's actually weaker or there, there are protests against him, then that could also drive him to want to be more aggressive. So either way, I think there are reasons for him to um, use the military or just be more aggressive in general. Um, the growing global economic network, uh, want to support that. Um, and that's connected to their increasing energy dependence. I mean, China imports most of its energy. Uh, and so that also drives a lot of their interest in having control of, of ports and these, these sea lanes of communication. Um, wolf warrior diplomacy is a concept that uh, Xi Jinping came up as well up with as well. It's, it's, a, it's the idea is coercive diplomacy. And so there's a kind of a, almost a sense of pride of China has, after being subjugated for a long time too, I didn't mention, I don't know if you're aware, I mean, China was um, not only, you know, raped and pillaged by the Japanese during World War II, but um, colonized by different European powers who, in the famous, um, the famous phrase, well, there was a Shanghai park where it said, you know, dogs and Chinese have to keep out. And this was in China, you know, there was, there was, um, I think that the Chinese nation, the Chinese people for a long time felt very subjugated by foreign powers. And so um, there's a sense of China awakening and really wanting to come into its own and being proud of that. What will happen next? Um, I don't think things are gonna get better soon. Um, China is gonna increasingly threaten Taiwan and the US will probably continue to say very strong things about you shouldn't do that and we're going to continue to give more capabilities to Taiwan. Um, that's going to come through in our national security assessments. Um, I think it's going to come through a lot more in our domestic politics. Um, I was at President Biden's speech in Poughkeepsie was last week um, and he mentioned China, that competing with China economically is one of the reasons that we want to invest in um, in the Poughkeepsie area and sort of high-tech computing. Uh, and I th Congress is really becoming more and more anti-China as well. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna hear a lot more about China as sort of this, this evil actor in the world, this an authoritarian state that it wants to get rid of this US-led international order, remake things to a more authoritarian style. Um, so it's gonna be more and more difficult at exactly the same time that a lot of these China watchers are no longer, no longer have easy access um, into China. Uh, so I think there is a growing possibility that some kind of accident could lead to a crisis. And we have, I think, fewer tools at our disposal right now to manage crises than we have had at, at certain points um, in the past. So I, I'm thinking of um, an accident that led to a crisis that was sort of managed many years ago um, you may, when the, the US EP3 plane um, it was, why did it go down on Hainan Island? Because a Chinese pilot acted unsafe and, act, and ran into it. And like the Chinese are engaging in a lot of unsafe behavior because they like to buzz our spy planes when we send spy planes near China. So something like that could happen again. And I th it, it could potentially lead to a bigger problem than it did the last time. Uh, I think China with its increased military capabilities um, and its sort of growing confidence is going to um, be more willing to try to pressure um, neighboring countries um, and sort of force them to resolve territorial disputes in the way, ways that it wants. Um, or just act like there's no dispute like it is in some places in the South China Sea. It's just building islands and saying these, these are my islands. Um, and I think it, it really does have the capability to sort of just blockade, Ty slowly strangle Taiwan, and um, they, they don't need to take it over militarily. 
Uh, this, is, this is one of the key questions that U.S. military analysts are looking at. Um, will the U.S. actually be overmatched by Chinese forces in the region by 2025, or when will that happen? It'll happen at some point because uh, China, the, the kind of investments they're making, the fact that Taiwan is right off their board, I mean, it's just not physically possible for the U.S. to counter that kind of investment from so far away in perpetuity. It's just, it's just not possible. Um, so these are some of the things that um, analysts will be watching to sort of get a sense of what the, you know, what the general direction will be, what, what kind of, what are China spending their military dollars on um, to the extent that we can find that out. That's one of the hardest things to know about the Chinese military. What kind of military to military engagements are we having with them? It's really not very many right now. We used to have more, but it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's important, but it's difficult to have those right now. How many exercises they're having? What kind of exercises? To what purpose? Um, what kind of statements do they see out of the Chinese leadership? And what does those say? And, um, and whether there are any Chinese leadership changes? Um, so I fully expect Xi Jinping to be elected to a third term this year. The, I, the question will be more about um, who else is sort of promoted or supported um, during the 20th Party Congress. And, um, where do they come from and what does that in indicate? So there's a little bit of almost like Kremlinology associated with, with this uh, at this point. Um, is war inevitable? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I'm not a pessimist, as I said. I, I, um, and I think these, the, there needs to be a, a continued focus on um, building as many bridges of communication as we can with the Chinese. Um, they're not super open to that in every respect, but uh, you, you, you can't give up um, at, at times like this. So uh, I'm focusing more in my professional life right now on, on cultural communication with China because that is a, an avenue that's, that's open to us. And so, um, for example, at Bard, we have a U.S.-China Music Institute. You think, well, what, is, what does music have to do with U.S.-China relations? Well, you know, what did ping pong have to do with U.S.-China relations? You gotta have, you gotta create whatever connections you can um, to support um, a more positive future. So um, I hope that that has been interesting.